Journal of Renark Airdwolf Battle Sorcerer of the Seventh Garnet. Entry date. Year 1012 of our Lord Pelor on the 22nd of Hillbreak. I left my small village for the halls of the Caldelai School for Magi. 117 years ago. I've lived in this region's capital of Drowl, the largest city in the northern dunes, since. I have trained alongside many great spellcasters, but I must say the two who've elected to join my expedition are my favorites. Bias towards old friends, I suppose. Firstly, there is Tung Halek, a half-elf battle sorcerer. And secondly, Ithaca Crowfeather, a gnome wizard. We three have been taught and now teach within the school's noble halls, but lately we felt a bit flighty. After some months of research, we finally left the school to unearth a relic which should bestow us quite the acclaim upon our return. If I am right, Lord, do I pray I am right. This morning we found passage on a sand strider and traveled deep into the northern dunes until we arrived at Valiant Gulch massive canyon which plummets several hundred feet. Deep in this canyon lay an underground structure which houses a relic of Calid which houses a relic of Caldelai himself, the progenitor of magic. We also met the rest of the expedition team, made up of four warriors a pair of crossbowmen, and two expert climbers, who helped us prepare all the gear, and after a brief bit of campfire bonding, we readied ourselves for tomorrow with a good rest. Entry date. Year 1012, the 23rd of Hillbreak. An hour after sunrise, we started to scale the canyon wall. Midway through this first day, a number of foul halflings attacked us from cracks in the wall. Earth chunks and ore had burst from under their skin. Molten magma pumped in their veins, and their eyes seemed little more than cooled lava. Despite the ambush, the creatures were felt mostly by the dwarf, Sir Greblar. His ferocious arm swung his mace so hard, I watched an awed horror as literally, as he literally pulverized the upper half of one of the poor bastards. Its two pieces bounced off the wall and left a glowing trail all the way down. I myself was grappled by one of them though I luckily managed a quick, shocking grasp to its head. The others fared fine as well, and after a brief round of potions, we continued. The next beast to appear was an earth elemental, shaped like a massive snake. Nearly sixty feet from head to tail, it burrowed in and out of the wall, slapping us around and forcing us to grind against the stone. We managed to climb despite its harassment, but it did force us to abandon the climb for a thin strip of craggy rock. We fought the beast bravely, albeit we nearly lost Ithaca, but though, <clears throat> but though our tenacity and stubbornness, we proved that the terrain, that the Terran serpent, <clears throat> but through tenacity and stubbornness, the Terran Serpent was felled, with the mighty Tong and myself using our powerful spells to blast the creature's head into smouldering pieces. 
injured and tired. I asked that we rest on the outcropping for a brief moment. Sir Greblar disagreed, said we should pressure on. Against my judgment, I conceded. We were hounded by more cursed halflings the rest of the day, and lost a whole crate of supplies to the depths thanks to Greblar's decision to drop it on one. We haven't even been able to sleep the entire time. We've only just made camp, and I can see the sky above us turning blue. Entry date, year 1012, on the 24th of Hubrick. By the time the sun rose to its zenith on the second day, we'd only just woken, and despite the healing and rest, I'm quite certain most of the expedition party shares my opinion of being absolutely wore down already. Regardless of this obvious tiredness, Greblar drives us forward. It's nearly the afternoon as I write this, and we've already descended twice more than we did yesterday, battling all manner of small earth elementals and more of the foul halflings. We've named them Orlings, after a comment Ithaca made about their appearance. <clears throat> Greblar is ending our break. I shall make another entry in the morning. Entry date. Year 1012, on the 25th of Hillbrick. Near the end of yesterday, I came the closest to death I have ever come, and I fought in the war for three years. The thrice damned Canyon Scorpion, massive brute of chitin and raw hunger, cut one of our ropes and almost sent myself and one of our warriors to a grisly death far below. Were it not for Julian's quick thinking and strong arm, we'd be jammed, smeared on the rocks. It's quite strong for a human, and so young even for his kind. I admire his staunch bravery in the face of such a short lifespan. Afterward, we attempted to sleep, but another ambush by the Orlings forced us deeper, and we climbed down at a feverish pace. Too much so. Two of our warriors fell after the rope was cut, while one of our climbing experts was spared the fall, due only to the crude pair of spears that pierced her chest. <sighs> Sweet Pelor, I have taken responsibility for their passing. My collection of tomes and scrolls mentioned a guarded entryway. But I expected traps, or perhaps ancient automatons, not a horde of cursed halflings and great monsters. The canyon was said to be barren. <sighs> Dauntless, Greblar allowed us to retrieve the bodies once we hit the bottom, and with the other dead we lit a pyre, said some prayers, then numbly prepared dinner in a muted celebration, having finally arrived at the bottom. Tong and Ithaca picked my brain last night as well for what horrors may lurk within the temple. I told them and the others exactly what the scrolls had said. Possible automatons and magical traps. Tong broke the cold still as they all looked at me warily with a joke. That sounds like hell. At least we'll have to find it first, he said. Postscript. Sleep hasn't been coming to me readily. Foul dreams pilfer and tunnel into my mind in a lurking shadow seems to lay claim over me while I sleep. I'm worried what we may find in the temple. Or, or perhaps I'm worried what may find us. Entry date. <clears throat> Year 1012 on the uh, 28th of Hillbrook. It has been three more days of walking, but we finally found the temple. 
on the opposite damned wall of the canyon, naturally. Grebla and I have been arguing for the last day, as he didn't believe I'd led us through the area properly. Shows what he knows, self-aggrandized bastard. On the topic of the temple, God, what behemoth made it? Forty foot high walls, twenty five foot high doors, ancient stone benches the size of wagons, and tables greater than a stadium in length. Tong said it made him think of the giants of legend, and while a week ago I'd have said he was mad, seeing this place, I am no longer certain. Much of the many rooms and structure we explored is also strange. Stone furnaces and architecture, walls, ceilings and floor inlaid with murals of myth and history, although far too faded to be of any legibility. The doors are, again, massive, and seem to be whole pieces of quartz with gold ball handles and dozens of withered statues which litter the halls and rooms. I'd written off the expedition for a minute as I lost myself in trying to understand the monolith of the revelation laid in front of us. The giants of myth, quite possibly very real. True it is that this find is a difficult thing to see such eldritch wonders, to witness un Deniable proof of fabled ancients who were said to feed from stars and ride dragons into battle. Stories of my childhood, where my mother would tell me such outlandish tales, now screamed into the forefront of my mind. The giants were famed for the punishments they would give out, and for where my youth was able to merely take the words as they were. My present state of mind drew far too many dark parallels to what had happened to us so far, and I will admit to a near spiraling of terror, but only a near one. Ithaca and Tong, as usual, kept me grounded. We elected to camp in what looks to be a place of worship. Julian pulled me aside after dinner and told me he's noticed Ithaca scratching at her arm that something pulsed beneath her sleeve. I wrote it off as uh, and told him it was little more than a bit of hysteria after such a arduous few days. No need to ask or pester about it when there's nothing to worry for, I said. He seemed nonplussed at my answer, so I compromised by agreeing to talk to her later, partly to assuage his worries, partly because if something was wrong with my dear Ithaca, I needed to know. I will make another entry, after I've spoken with her. Entry date. <coughs> Entry date year 1012. 35th of Hillbrack. Ithaca, my sister in all but blood, I pray you forgive me. I pray you do not curse and haunt me until I at last perish. We talked. I asked about her arm, inspected it, saw nothing of note, and could find no lie or malice in her eyes. She was the light of my life, the sister I had wanted growing up. We spoke and discussed ideas, then I excused myself. She smiled, nodded to me, and went to bed. Early a moment later, I felt a great burning in my head and 
sunk to my knees. As a gurgling screech echoed from her mouth, and a spark of iron erupted from the arm I hadn't checked. More ore spikes and earthen talons grew from her flesh. Her eyes exploded into flowing pools of magma. She rushed me, a gurgling screech unending. Ribla tried to hold her off unarmed, but was thrown back, while Julian, Tong, and the others used whatever they could to pin or knock her down. She seemed undeterred by the seven men and women tackling her. She even managed to shake them off. And she looked at me again. The skin of her face had melted away due to the magma dripping from her eyes. The bones of her jaw hissing and popping as they seared away. And she unveiled another screech as she charged at me. Yet again. I... I'm unsure if the shock of seeing her in that state, or perhaps just the entire ordeal thus far, left my, my mind broken, but I ran forward, dagger drawn, and drove my dagger into her chest. She sputtered and then I screamed. I screamed as I used all the magic I could to drive a lightning bolt straight through her. I screamed as I continued to assail her body with all the lightning and acid spells I could muster until I had left a smoldering corpse. I believe I fell to my knees and sobbed for eternity. I learned later that Tong and Julian dragged me away and helped calm me down. When I finally regained myself, Greblar sat with me and said one of the warriors she'd injured had turned as well. They'd put him down when they noticed his arm pulsed as something writhed beneath his flesh. Next to you, looked at me and... I noticed a, a fresh cut on my leg, around where Erythaca had stabbed me. He told me Julian was concerned I'd turn as well after you long did. So he took... He and Tong cut my leg open. And they said they pulled a... thing from me. Wouldn't elaborate. I've decided to leave it alone. He said he and some others went back to the entrance and made sure the doors wouldn't shut by knocking them off their hinges. And then any time I wanted to call it off, he'd agree. I meekly shuddered and wept, and the dwarf eventually left me be. I woke yesterday, and now I sit in my tent as Greblar heals my wounds, and I write, and I weep. Pelor, O oh golden lore of light and sun, why have you allowed me into this hell? Why have you allowed me to lead these poor men and women to such a terrible place? What was my sin which has condemned me, which has condemned us all to this? Entry date, year 10, 12, <clears throat> 10th of Gardenfield. We found the vault room, despite Ithaca, despite our losses, despite my questioning the gods, we've made the most wonderful discovery. Last week, Julian discovered a tablet written in Draconic. 
difficult to read but doable. It was essentially a map of this underground temple, which we discovered is more of a city. Ithaca would have loved this. I asked the expedition, and, and we've all agreed to name this place Ithaca's Discovery for official records. So at least she'll be remembered forever in that regard. We found a great stone tube. <clears throat> okay. We found a great stone tube, <clears throat> which the map suggests is a lift of some kind, and to take it down will lead us to the vault room. The issue is that it is surprisingly submerged halfway down. The map said a reservoir or something like it was in the room next to us. And while we all can swim just fine, we'll have to abandon some of the gear. After a vote, we decided in the morning we'll split the team and leave half here to watch our supplies while the other descends. As an afterthought, <clears throat> those dreams have persisted and grown venomously worse since Ithaca's, since Ithaca's death. She guts me and screams at me and eats me while I'm alive until my flesh turns to stone, my eyes bleed magma and my chest explodes with spikes of iron. Do I deserve these dreams? for leading us all down here. Entry date. <clears throat> Year 1012, 11th of Gardenfield. We tried multiple times to find the right entryway to the vault hallway, till finally we figured it out and arrived where we've been for the last few hours. Grevlar let us use his bag of holding to keep most of the gear with us and waterproofed. After a fairly long time, we've moved everything down here and have made a camp in front of the vault door. This vault was a puzzle to open. Tong and I being the only well-versed arcanists here, we worked alone against the magical locks for hours. But at last, I found the key. I had misread a passage on the wall and thought it wanted a gift, and I thought magic might work, but the word isn't gift, it's, it's sacrifice. And the keyhole was roughly big enough I could fit my arm in. <clears throat> I made a prayer to Pelor, threw a strip of leather in my mouth, and thrust my arm inside. The pain, as my arm was severed and drawn away from me, had me reeling back and spasming. Grabla and Tong worked quickly, halted the bleeding and numbed my pain. Losing an arm certainly seems a harsh price for the ordeal I dragged everyone into, but one I no less needed to pay. The vault opened and before us laid the greatest treasury I have ever witnessed. Hundreds of feet high, wide, and long, it was a gargantuan tube-shaped room filled with gold and gems, or in a single foreboding statue. While the others filled their pockets with coin and valuables, Tong and I approached the statue. I lifted it from the pedestal and handed it to him, and I hugged him tightly. We'd done it camped outside the vault, had another small celebration, and prepared to head home. Tong Hyok's Journal, Battle Sorcerer of the Seventh Connet. Year 1012, 
the 14th of Gardenville. It all went to hell immediately. We woke in the midst of one of our crossbowmen being gutted and Greblar fending off four of the cursed fucking Orlings. He grabbed our gear and bolted. I swam up fighting, ran through the halls fighting, till Greblar tossed me the bag of holding with our gear and turned to the horde of abominations. I looked to Renark for aid in dragging the fool dwarf with us, but he had already bolted down the hallway as Greblar bellowed at me to do the same. As we neared the atrium, Renark was gored by a spear. And while he killed his attacker, we both knew he wasn't long for the world. He slumped beneath a towering mural, blood pooling at his feet. He simply handed me his journal and said, Make sure they remember Ithaca. Then, with an almost serene smile, he raised a hand, and a great well of magic coiled around him as the earth began to shake. Cracks in the walls and floor boomed like thunder, and I watched as my friend cried for me to leave. I didn't want to move, and I was forced to when Julian grabbed me and pulled me rung. Pulled me out into the basin as the walls and door frame crumpled and collapsed, sealing my friend in with the horde of cursed bastards. We ran back across the canyon to our rigging and rusted again, taking shifts and using up our potions to heal. We poured out some flasks of wine for our friends and did our best to find sleep. Year 1012, the 16th of Gardenville. We climbed without stopping. Two days without rest, and so... so much fighting. We lost two more just as we neared the top. Filthy bastards literally cutting their ropes and ripping them apart as they fell. The moment we got to the surface, Julian hurriedly rushed the Sand Strider crew into action, and within ten minutes we'd caught a favorable wind. I stare, now as I write this, back at the canyon which is little less than a brown line in the endless white dunes beneath us. We'd come here for acclaim and renown. I've left with nightmares and regret. <sighs> well, that was interesting, eh? <clears throat> that is the first tale of my uh, adventure summaries. Got a few more planned. Uh, basically just picking out uh, some stories from my time playing tabletop role-playing games. That one was from a, uh, a, uh, a 5e campaign about a year ago. I was playing as uh, Renark. My friend and uh, my, my uh, friends I was playing with were Julian, Ithaca, Greblar, and uh, Tong. And that was uh, the story of that campaign, which was three sessions. Uh, and and it was, it's from, from Renark's perspective. I'm going to try to perfect this as I go on for future video's sake, but um, if you enjoyed this, please uh, like subscribe I really appreciate that and comment you know let me know if any of y'all who watch this enjoyed the story uh, thank you so much for watching and uh, I'll see you in the next video hopefully bye